Uh, my job now is to introduce our, uh, one of our um, keynote speakers, um, uh, Bishop Michael. And um, as you know, we're, we're all about St. Chad here in Litchfield Diocese, known for crossing boundaries and sharing faith and um, obedience to the gospel and inviting people to follow Christ. Um, all this was done in a time of huge upheaval, not unlike what you're going through um, in education at, at the moment. Uh, Bishop Michael, um, you'll see from the biog, is from the East Midlands. Oh dear, is that an omen? Um, he's here, he's in the room. Chad, that is. Um, and so, born in Northamptonshire, and he's been in Leicester and down to Southwark, and now he's back to the West Midlands. Um, so he knows about moving about. Um, and Bishop Michael's had um, also done a lot of work with interfaith um, areas and in reconciliation, and he himself has been honored with an OBE for that work. He served as a parish priest, a chaplain, an archdeacon, an area bishop, and now a diocesan bishop. He knows all about crossing boundaries. He loves um, to travel, um, helping bring people together, calling people to follow Christ. What what's, uh, I find interesting, he has an abundant interest and enjoyment in meeting people. He really is putting himself about in this diocese. He's only been here a year and a half, uh, but he's getting out across the diocese in a big way. He loves the gospel, as you hope a bishop would do, uh, but he also, <laughs> you know, you look for something like that, don't you? A bit of belief and a bit of faith and love, but he's got that. Uh, but he also has bags of energy and a real can-do attitude. Um, he's the 99th Bishop of Litchfield, but he's the 21st century personification of St. Chad. He's channeling St. Chad in a big way. Uh, we haven't actually got a picture of um, Chad from the 7th century, I don't think, have we? No. Oh, he's going to draw one. See, he'll be able to do it. But personality-wise, you know, when Michael's here, I feel Chad is in the room. Um, so he's got drive, energy, love of God, love of people. No need for a horse or a car. Have shoes, will travel. That seems to be uh, Bishop Michael's attitude. So please welcome our first keynote speaker, uh, Bishop Michael Itgrave. Thank you very much indeed, Bishop Mark. I'm, I'm speechless, but uh, what can I say? Um, good morning. It's wonderful to be here. There are a few seats at the front. That's what we always say in the Church of England for people who are if you want to sit. Um, thank you very much to um, the Board of Education and to you, Colin, for the invitation to speak a bit this morning um, on this wonderful theme of In the Footsteps of St. Chad. Before I do that, I just want to echo what Bishop Mark said, Colin, about your, well, your opening presentation this morning, which was a strategic overview full of wisdom, experience, and Christian insight. And that's what marks your work in this diocese. Thank you for all that you bring to us and have brought to us. And I want to pay tribute to your um, sense of strategy, your wisdom, your commitment and your energy. And of course, what's really important is not that I contribute to that, but that um, you've been paid tribute to on a much more national scale through award, being awarded an MBE. I think on the 1st of June, you'll be invested as a member of the most excellent order of the British Empire. So congratulations. Can we just show our appreciation? Um, so the title I've been given is In the Footsteps of St. Chad. And what I want to do, I think, is to say a little bit about St. Chad, um, who did differ from me in quite a lot of ways, actually. Um, and then to talk about the three priorities that, for me, are important as we reflect on his witness today in the Diocese of Litchfield. And in each case to ask you just amongst yourselves in kind of, you know, um, without pricking your neck too much, to talk amongst your neighbours about what this might mean in your school context. Um, to remind you that the direction of travel that I have encouraged this diocese to, 
to adopt goes under the banner, Come, Follow Christ in the Footsteps of St. Chad. Um, and out of that, the three priorities that I'm drawing particularly are discipleship, vocation, and evangelism. More of that anon. Just a bit about St. Chad first. To remind you, Chad was um, the fifth bishop of the Mercians, but the first bishop of Lichfield. He came here in 669. He died in 672. Um, after an episcopate of only three years. I've been doing a little bit of um, prudential research on how bishops of Lichfield have come to their end recently. It's, it, it's not an encouraging story. Um, Chad died of the plague, actually, um, but partly because he kind of worn himself out in putting himself around all across this vast diocese. And just to reflect on the, the place that he came to, Mercia, his diocese was Mercia, was much bigger than the present diocese of Lichfield, but still centred here. Um, and of course, a massively different context then compared to now, but some things were the same. Um, the name Mercia means the marches, the, the, the place of the borderlands, um, and it was very much a meeting place. If you look at the place names in this part of the world, there are Roman survivals, there are a lot of a surprising amount of ancient British place names, and of course there's the Anglo-Saxons. So you had a great kind of mingling of people, peoples, as we do in our own time. Um, he came at a time when it was partly Christian and partly pagan, one of the last bits of England, really, to accept the gospel wholeheartedly, and that largely through his witness. But there were Christians here before him. So again, you know, you can't, it's quite difficult to characterize the religious complexion of Mercia in Chad's time as it is today, I think. He spent three years traveling across this, va his vast diocese. And as he went, he was doing two things, really. He was strengthening the Christian communities that were there, and he was evangelizing. He was bringing the good news of the gospel to those who were not Christians, particularly to those um, who worshipped the old pagan gods of the Anglo-Saxons. Ever wondered why there are so many places called, you know, Wed Wednesfield, Wensbury, or those places from the name of Woden? Um, the, 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 the gods survived um, in parts of this diocese for longer than in other parts of England. He came from Northumbria. And, you know, he was an Anglo-Saxon, but we kind of tend to think Anglo-Saxons, they're all one group of people. I do. Maybe you don't think about Anglo-Saxons very often. I do all the time. Um, I've been told that I live in the seventh century, which is kind of good, a good place to be. But actually, Anglo-Saxons were a very varied group of people themselves, divided into different tribes and constantly fighting wars with one another. Chad was from Northumbria, and in about five years before he came here, Northumbrian had been engaged in a really bloody, violent conflict with Mercia that ended up with Oswald, the king of Northumbria, being um, killed on the battlefield by Penda, his body decapitated and hung on a tree at what is now called Oswald's Tree, Oswald's Tree, again in Ardasis. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a friendly place for Chad to come to. So he showed considerable courage. Um, important, of course, on a day like this, to, to think about his education. I'll come back to that in a minute, but he was, as a Northumbrian, he was educated at Lindis Farm, the great island or semi-island um, monastery off the coast of Northumbria, which at that time was probably what you would call the centre of excellence of learning um, in the England of that period. A few years after Chad had been there, we think, the scriptorium there produced that magnificent um, bound Lindisfarne Gospels, beautifully illuminated manuscript. And it was the place that kept um, the light of learning, both classical learning and Christian learning, alive in a religious context in what we sometimes dismissively call the Dark Ages. More than that, Chad actually travelled to Ireland, which on a European scale, was very much the place that kept civilization alive in the seventh century. So education was hugely important for him. And um, just reflecting on what Colin was saying, 
an education in which um, nation and church could not be divided and wider culture and the specifically Christian tradition were conveyed at the same time. Um, just briefly, he, he went, he became a monk, um, not at Lindisfarne, but he went to Lustingham in North Yorkshire. He came from quite a, um, well, I suppose it would be charitable to call him a, a, a pious family, in that he had four, uh, four brothers, I think, three, four brothers, uh, all of whom became saints. Uh, and the eldest one, St. Said, um, became what we would nowadays call the first bishop of Chelmsford, except he didn't describe himself in those terms. He was the first bishop in Essex. So there was something in Chad's family as well that, uh, that was shaping him for his, for his future career. And then there was the kind of big hiccup in Chad's life, uh, which I won't go into in detail because it's quite kind of embarrassing really, but he, was, he found himself mistakenly, let us say, appointed as Bishop of York, as Bishop of the Northumbrian people. Uh, mistakenly because another claimant to that uh, title, St. Wilfrid, uh, had been off in um, Gaul preparing to come back to be Bishop of York and um, buying all the kind of stuff that he felt a properly um, accoutred bishop ought to have. Um, so there was an embarrassing moment when Wilfred arrived back in York to find Chad um, occupying his episcopal chair. The Archbishop of Canterbury had to intervene, which he was allowed to do in those days in the northern province. And um, Chad, with great humility, said, oh, that's fine. I never really wanted to be Bishop of York anyway. I'll go back to my monastery, which was just such a kind of gracious and humble thing to do. Shortly after that... Um, the King of Mercia decided he want, needed to appoint a bishop to his diocese here, and knowing of Chad's recognised humility, holiness and energy, invited him here, thank God, to Lichfield, where he showed all those same qualities again, spent his time um, walking around, he refused to ride a horse, teaching um, kind of building a culture of hospitality and encounter around him that dramatically transformed the life of this part of England. So it's a great figure in whose footsteps um, I hope we can walk together and a great local figure because his legacy and his the lasting changes that he brought are written into the history and the landscape and the place names and everything to do with this part of England, the ancient um, kingdom of Mercia. Out of his, that pattern of life, as I said, I want to draw three priorities, which is what I'm encouraging the diocese, and by diocese I mean the whole diocesan family, I'll say a bit about, more about that in a moment, to focus on. And to use church language, those are the priorities of discipleship, of vocation, and of evangelism. So let me say a little bit about each in turn and invite you, as I said, in the context of your school or a school you know well or a school near you, whatever, to think about what those things mean and just talk amongst yourselves. First of all, discipleship. Um, Chad followed Jesus in a life of committed learning throughout his life. I talked about his education and that monastic background was really important for him. And as I said, at that time, monasteries were the great centres of learning. They were also the great centres of church life. And in a sense, what has happened in European history is that from the single source of the monastic life of Christians committed to that pattern of rigorous lifelong discipleship. From that, two streams, it seems to me, have descended. One which we now call churches, and one which we now call schools. And I, I would love us to think about ways in which we can rebuild the bridges between church and school, which share that common origin in a monastic commitment to a life uh, to lifelong learning as disciples of Jesus. So in the diocese as a whole, I want to see our churches in some way, our 
parish churches, a bit more like schools, where people really commit to being disciples, to learning more about the Christian faith throughout their lives. I mean, you never know it all. And it's such an exciting and, for me, a really thrilling um, opportunity for all our Christians to take education into the life of the churches seriously. If, that's, if our churches should be a bit more like schools, what about the other way around? What about schools and churches? Well, I'm trying to encourage the diocese as a whole to think of ourselves not just as parishes, important as those are, but as parishes, fresh expressions, chaplaincies, and schools. It seems to me there are four principal ways in which Christian life is present locally in our communities, and those are parishes, fresh expressions, a growing number of them, chaplaincies in a number of institutions, and church schools. So those four forms, and I said this um, in the context of something in the cathedral and was told that I needed to add the cathedral as a fifth context, which is quite true. What then does a church school as an expression of local Christian presence look like? How does your school or a school you know function as a place of discipleship, a place to encourage and shape the habits that will make um, students want to be lifelong learners in the path of Jesus Christ? Do you feel that your church school is in any sense a kind of church? And if so, how does that express itself? And kind of leaving aside what the school itself feels like, what is your relationship with your local parish church like? How is the church, the parish church, school relationship like in your context? Those are a set of kind of questions around what discipleship can mean in church schools. Could you just, don't be shy, just kind of talk to people near you for a bit, um, for a few minutes, and see if, those, if you get anywhere with those sort of questions.
And as you say, it was it incorporated the whole sense of learning, classical learning and learning to yeah. disciple together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Well, I'm going to get them together again, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you very much for being so, so buzzy. Um, it's wonderful. I will, I'll give you something else um, to, to, to talk about in a minute as well, but do carry on those conversations. I'm not going to particularly ask for, for feedback at this point, but I hope that the kind of um, things you're talking about, if, if you're talking about what I asked you to talk about, anyway, um, I hope that those will feed into the kind of conversations and your thinking throughout the day. So I talked, and, and you talked uh, a bit about discipleship. The second um, priority that I want to kind of pinpoint is that of vocation, um, which differs um, generically, really, from discipleship. Discipleship, in a sense, for me, is the same for everybody. Everybody is called to be a follower of Jesus Christ throughout their life. Vocation, as I use the word, is something that is different for each person. I'm using it to talk about the specific um, call of God into our lives to be a particular kind of person, to do a particular kind of thing, to take on a particular responsibility. Um, and that will be different for each person because, um, as St. Paul says of, of the church as a body, every member has a different part to play. Now, in working out, discerning, to use that language, what our individual vocation is, is sometimes, in some respects, quite straightforward and can sometimes be very complicated. Um, just to, to go back to Chad, um, some of what he was meant to be, some of his vocation, seems to have come to him very easily, like becoming a monk. It may have helped that his four brothers, five brothers, however many there were, also all became monks. But he didn't seem to have any question about the sense of vocation to the monastic life, or indeed vocation to being ordained. But as I described um, in the, um, the little unpleasantness that happened around the Diocese of York, um, sometimes he got it wrong, and it was really hard to discern what he was called to be. Uh, at a particular time. And that's our experience too. Sometimes there is a very clear sense of vocation and sometimes it takes a lot of working at and listening to other people and circumstances working out before you finally realise what you are meant to do. And of course this is a particular um, challenge for young people, um, the young people who are entrusted to the care of our schools where their growing years in one sense, is a, is a, a whatever, two decades of ex or th two or three or more decades of exercise of discernment as to what is my vocation in life. I want um, us in, in the diocese as a whole, in the diocesan family, I want us to focus alongside discipleship and evangelism on vocational renewal. There is a particular um, one particular dimension of that about vocations to ordained ministry where in common with the rest of the Church of England we are committing and I th I'm hopeful, I think rather than confident, hopeful that we will reach the aspiration of increasing the number of ordinands of those experiencing vocation to the priesthood by 50% by 2020. But it's not only about clergy, it's about Christians living out their vocation in their daily lives. So where do schools fit into that? And my second set of questions for you are around that. How does your school um, work as a vocational community? And that's about a number of things. I think it's about how does it enable 
students to work out what their sense of vocation is. It's also, of course, about teachers and other educational staff. I mean, teaching alongside nursing is probably the profession for which, apart from clergy, the language of vocation has been used most often in the past. Sometimes that feels a little bit under attack to me nowadays. But how do we renew that sense of the teaching ministry, of the ministry of teachers as a vocation, and of others in the school, and indeed of school governors, and those involved in school leadership, and those involved in the Diocesan Board of Education of the National Society? How do we stimulate that sense of being, this is not just a job we've been asked to do, but this is a vocation? And I suppose in terms of encouraging students to work out their vocation, also what, how do we set alongside uh, that lived example day by day? How do you set alongside that other examples of vocation, including um, the vocation to be a priest? How many children and students in church schools see good examples of priestly vocation that might trigger something in them? So. However, whatever direction you want to take this in, it's the most difficult one, really, because vocation means so many different things. How does your school work as a vocational community? I want to just talk about that for a little while.
good. No. Thank, thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for engaging us. I thought that was really quite a difficult set of questions, but you've, you've obviously got the answers, so that's very encouraging. Um, discipleship, vocation, and my third priority is evangelism. Now, evangelism um, is a word which scares uh, some people in the Church of England, um, and uh, which probably scares even more people in Church of England schools, actually. And a word also which some people um, prefer to say evangelization. I'm not going to get into all that kind of argument about what we call it. Um, Chad, Saint Chad, excuse me, was um, tireless in telling the good news of the gospel to the people he met and the society in which he lived. And very importantly, he did do that in words. He had a clear message to communicate. But he also, and I think this was why his uh, legacy was so deeply rooted and so long-lasting, he did it through the kind of life that he lived by embodying a culture of relationship, of warmth, of valuing the people he met, and of, of humility, actually, of, of not putting himself above anybody else. That famous story of him refusing to ride a horse that had been given him um, until he was instructed to do so by the Archbishop of Canterbury. We have um, entrusted to us the greatest story ever told and the greatest story that ever could be told, the story of a God who loves each one of us so much and loves us all so much that he comes to share our life, to share our death and to conquer death for us. And that is good news for everybody. And evangelism really simply means telling that story and inviting others to make that story their own. Schools are not places for proselytism. We all know that. They're not places where one can um, seek an unfair advantage to, to try to sell a product to young people. And our church schools, as Colin said, respect and indeed I would say in many ways celebrate the variety and the integrity of people's beliefs in our diverse society. But schools and not but and schools are definitely places to embody and to commend the gospel, which is good news for everybody and good news for our society. And as Colin said, is a very, very significant um, piece of good news for those who are trying to build community cohesion in our country. So my third set of questions, I mean, I think one can, well, perhaps one can't take for granted that churches are committed to evangelism, but they know they ought to be. My third set of questions is about schools and evangelism. Um, I suppose, you know, what does evangelism in a positive way mean in the context of your school? How is the gospel communicated in and by the values, the ethos of your school and the witness of the members of its communities? How do you provide Christian values, a Christian foundation um, for young people which can be a bedrock for their life, whatever the way that they express their faith in the future. How can one provide a Christian foundation for them? And how does your school provide a base for evangelism in the wider community? So just talk for a little bit about evangelism, the spreading of the good news in your schools. Thanks.
Um, thank, ooh, thank you very much. Um, I, just, I just want to finish by saying, first of all, thank you to all of Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your engagement um, and for, for, um, for engaging with those questions, which I hope you can kind of keep with you for the rest of the day. And much beyond that, thank you for all that you do. Um, in our church schools for the, for the education that you provide for our children and young people and for the way in which you are very valued and treasured members of our diocesan family. Thank you so much. And it's an enormous um, privilege and honour to have served as the warm-up act for the Dean of Westminster.